Hi everybody, it's Binary Bill, coming to you live from my lab, deep in the heart of Silicon Valley. Have you ever wondered what's inside the electronic devices that you use every day, like your cell phone, your computer, how they work, what makes them tick? Well, today, we're going to find out. Before we get into the details, why don't we tear open a few electronic gadgets and see if we can identify the components that are inside. Well, let's look inside an Xbox and see what components we find. Up at the top, I see a case. This is what houses the, the unit and all the components within it. We have a fan, which help blows air through the case and keeps the components cool. A heat sink, which is used to suck the heat out of some of the higher, hotter components in the system. And then we have the motherboard. The motherboard controls the main function of the, of the Xbox, and it's loaded with integrated circuits. You can see all these little black instances on the motherboard are different types of integrated circuits for different functions. Some of them control the video, some of them control the audio, and then we have the central processing unit. This is the main brain of the, of the Xbox that performs all the major computations and graphics manipulations. Now let's take a look at an old school cell phone. On the front side, you have the case with the keyboard and an opening for display. Behind that, you would have a, a circuit board with the camera and the actual LCD display screen. At the very back, you have the back of the case and the battery. And in the middle, you have the motherboard, which again is full of integrated circuits. You can see each of these black shapes is another integrated circuit. The same with the silver shapes. These are also integrated circuits that perform some custom specific uh, application for the device. And down at the bottom, this is the main processor unit that processes all the main functions in the cell phone. So now I want to talk to you about some integrated circuits that I was actually involved in their development. About 10 years ago, I worked for a company called Real3D, whose business was to make graphics accelerators for video games and personal computers. I was personally involved in the Starfighter project and helped design the graphics chip that went on that product. Here's a close-up of the Starfighter graphics card. This card would plug into a desktop computer using these prongs at the bottom of the card. And then you would connect your display uh, or monitor to this port up at the top. Can you spot the integrated circuits on this card? Well, we have the main graphics card here. We've got a few memory integrated circuits here and then a power supply integrated circuit that controls the power to the board. So now that we know that our electronic devices are built with integrated circuits, let's take a second to talk about what's inside the integrated circuits. The basic building block of an integrated circuit is a transistor. Transistors are tiny little on-off switches that control the flow of electricity. These switches are connected by super fine wires, wires that are less than the thickness of a human hair. An integrated circuit can have hundreds or even billions of transistors and wires to make them work. Let's look at this next video for another explanation of the transistor. In this phone, there are nearly a hundred million transistors. In this computer, there's over a billion. The transistor is in virtually every electronic device we use. TVs, radios, Tamagotchis. But how does it work? Well, the basic principle is actually incredibly simple. It works just like this switch. So it controls the flow of electric current. It can be off, so you could call that the zero state, or it could be on, the one state. And this is how all of our information is now stored and processed in zeros and ones, little bits of electric current. But unlike this switch, a transistor doesn't have any moving parts. 
and it also doesn't require a human controller. Furthermore, it can be switched on and off much more quickly than I can flick this switch. And finally, and most importantly, it is incredibly tiny. Well, this is all thanks to the miracle of semiconductors. Well, now that we know that transistors are used to designate zeros and ones, let's find out how those zeros and ones are used in the system to perform computations and useful work. Throughout history, almost every civilization has used a decimal number system with 10 digits, 0 through 9. All of the numbers we can possibly think of use some combination of those 10 digits. Computers, however, operate very differently. Instead, they use a number system that has just two digits, 1 and 0. This system is called binary, and your computer uses it all the time. Computers need information in order to do what they do. This digital information, or data, is made up of something called bits. Bit is short for binary digit, meaning each bit is really just a single number, either a 1 or a 0. These bits can be combined to create larger units like bytes, megabytes, and so on, that we use to measure our files. The larger a file is, the more bits it has. So something like a high-resolution video is actually made up of millions and millions and millions of ones and zeros. So how exactly do these ones and zeros come together and allow a computer to function? Let's think of binary as a light switch. Imagine that a one represents the light switch being on, and zero represents it being off. With binary, the light is either on or off with no other possible states. So these bits are strung together as different combinations of ones and zeros, and they form a kind of code. Your computer then rapidly processes this code and translates it into data, telling it what to do. You might be wondering, why do computers use binary instead of the decimal system that we use for counting things in the real world? Well, as previously mentioned, binary has two states, off and on. If computers were to use decimal, there would be 10 states instead. Our computers would have to work a lot harder to process all of these. Binary is easier for them to process and also takes up less space. Just like atoms make up everything around us in the real world, everything in the digital world, including video, text, pictures, and more, can be broken down into binary. And even though we can't see them, it's all a bunch of ones and zeros. Now that we have an idea of how integrated circuits work, with transistors and the binary numbering system, let's take a look at how technology advances has changed the devices that we use in everyday life. As you can see, advances in automobiles have come a long way with the use of integrated circuits. Before the latest technology, we depended on our cars at very basic levels. In fact, we had to start up our cars manually by cranking a wheel in front of the engine. As technology advanced, we added clocks and radios to our dashboard. We added electronic windows that open the windows at the press of a button. We now have cars that tell us how to get from here to there safely, can warn us of traffic conditions ahead, and even drive, them, drive by themselves. Can you think of any other features that were added to cars with the adoption of integrated circuits? As you can see, advances in vacuum cleaners have also come a long way thanks to integrated circuits and technology advancements. We used to push and direct our vacuum cleaners with our very own muscles. We cleaned out the contents of a very heavy machine that made a lot of noise. Today, we have vacuum cleaners that start cleaning themselves based upon how they are programmed. These machines can navigate our entire home around furniture and pets, and when done, head back to their base station to recharge themselves and empty the dirt they collected so they will be ready for the next round of cleaning. What other home appliances do you think can be improved through computerization? Moving on, as you can see, there have been significant advances in refrigerators with the addition of integrated circuits and computer technology. Way back when, we kept our food cold in an ice box, cooled only by a large brick of ice. Every couple of days, we would need to go to the ice house to get another heavy block. 
When these units were introduced, people thought they were a huge advancement and huge convenience. Today, our refrigerators are controlled by sensors and computers that monitor and adjust the temperature based on the food inside. They can tell us when we are out of milk and even order our groceries online for us. What other features do you think we can add to these refrigerators? The need to communicate has been a basic human need since the beginning of time. We need to communicate with one another and throughout history have counted on all types of systems to do so. If we go way back, we are truly amazed at how language began and how various cultures and lands created their own language to speak to one another. Communication that has been more recent to the last 100 years counted on our eloquence how well we can expand our thoughts on paper in letter to one another. Newspapers were a great source of information for many years. In this manner, all countries could hear what was happening around the globe. TV then sped up the process and video made news come alive. The telephone made our systems of communication much more personable by just picking up an earpiece and a mouthpiece and asking for an operator. We could get connected to someone far away in that moment. Wow. Now we are able to do so much more. We can travel while speaking to, to someone. We can talk to anyone in any place at any time. And we have devices that keep getting smaller and smaller to work harder and faster. How do you see our communication changing in the years to come? Will we still need to write or type our thoughts to communicate with others? The first computers were introduced in the early 1950s. They were huge machines that filled up a complete room and were so expensive that only a few large companies could afford to build and use them. Despite their size and cost, the early machines had limited performance and application. Personal computers were introduced in the late 1970s to the early 1980s. With a somewhat lower price and size, businesses and individuals were able to begin to take advantage of this new technology. Today we have iPads and smart watches with more computing power than was used to send the first Apollo missions to the moon. We can connect wirelessly to other devices and live stream to our friends over the internet. If you didn't have your cell phone or internet, how would you communicate with other people? What would you do each day? We've gotten a glimpse inside various devices to identify their components. We talked about how integrated circuits use transistors and the binary numbering system. And we have explored how advances in integrated circuits have shaped our world and the devices we use every day. Now, let's take a look into the future. How will continued advances in integrated circuits affect our lives? As transistors become smaller and computers more capable, what new ways can they be used to make our lives better? In the not too distant future, when you are graduating high school, how would technology advancements have shaped the world? And what new fields of study in math and science will you need to be successful? Emerging industries like artificial intelligence, robotics, deep space travel, self-driving cars, and advanced communication systems will need smart STEM superstars like yourself to continue their development. Are you ready for the challenge? I hope you enjoyed this presentation and can see how the future depends on you and the new ideas you will bring forward to make the world a better place. Well, it's time to get back to work. Take care for now.